The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. I have to uh, thank you for joining us, and I was going to say, um, let's let's start out by explaining um, who you are, first of all. Well, my name's Mark Allen Frost. I'm uh, a researcher, I guess you would say. I've been a professional chef uh, and a clinical hypnotherapist. Uh, I was also a social worker for a few years, so I've had a few careers. Uh, and then uh, the last, wow, 13 years, I've been the collaborator with uh, Seth, a non-physical author and educator. Uh, so that's who I am. We've written 11 books together. Uh, we also give uh, Seth readings to people over the telephone, people from all different walks of life, people from all around the world phone up Seth, and he uh, sort of acts like a uh, transpersonal coach to people, advising them on what to do in their lives. Wow. And I'm, mar I'm married to Carol Joy, uh, my wife, who's also a, a writer. She does a practice called Joy Healing that we enjoy, and we have a bunch of cats uh, that are like our little uh, tribal collective here. They're, they're basically <laughs> like our kids. So yeah. We worship them. How did you um, come to meet Seth um, originally, and how did it how did it start for you? Well, let me talk about who Seth is and how he entered our system of reality originally. Uh, a woman named Jane Roberts. Uh, she was uh, a writer, a poet. Her husband Robert Butts was an artist. They were living in Elmira, New York in the early 60s, and uh, Jane Roberts began to have what she called uh, psychic uh, disturbances. She would hear voices, uh, she would see apparitions uh, in her home, she would see figures, uh, and she decided to get a, a Ouija board. <laughs> of all things, to <laughs> explore what might be happening to her. So she got a hold of a Ouija board that her and her husband, Rob, used it to uh, decipher some of these messages they were receiving. Uh, specifically, uh, this guy named Seth came through, uh, and over the course of a few days of exploration, uh, he made it known that he wanted to uh, give messages to Jane and her husband that they were to put in books and uh, distribute to humanity, as he calls it. And that began the Seth project, the Seth material. Jane and her husband wrote uh, a number of books uh, dictated by Seth through Jane, and Rob, her husband, would take down the dictation in his own little sort of shorthand symbology. And they made books out of that. Uh, they became very well known. Uh, she's probably the most well-known medium of that era. Uh, and then in 1984, she uh, became very ill and made her transition, as Seth calls it. Uh, she passed away in 1984. And Seth was dictating his messages through her up until the very end. Uh, and everyone thought that, well, obviously, they presumed that since she was no longer in a physical body, that Seth would stop transmitting his messages. And uh, that was true for the most part. Uh, and then in, let me see, when did we get a hold of Seth? 2002, I was a hypnotherapist. I had a little practice in San Rafael, California, 
just up the street from the Grateful Dead house. If your listeners are familiar with that. Um, I was within a, a thrown stone's distance of that. Uh, and I had a little practice, I called it deep humor hypnotherapy, where I helped people who were trying to stop smoking, lose weight, uh, conquer their fears. I helped them use altered states of consciousness, such as uh, humor, um, gratitude, and so on, to conquer their fears and to lose weight and so on. Um, one day, a woman phoned me. Her name was Kat Smith. And she said, I'd like a uh, past life regression. And so I talked to my mentor at the university. I was going to Dominican University to get my marriage and family therapist uh, credentials. Hmm. Uh, and my mentor there was a transpersonal uh, psychologist. So he was uh, steeped in the alternative therapies, uh, hypnotherapy and so on. And he taught me how to do a past life regression. And I uh, brought the woman into my office and gave her a few suggestions. and. Within minutes, she was accessing what was apparently a past life in which she was uh, being devoured by uh, lions hmm. uh, in the Roman Colosseum. Um, so I kind of got, it startled me to see that. I, I asked her to uh, project her body out of her project her consciousness out of her body mm -hmm. and so that she wouldn't have to feel that pain and tell me what uh, was going on. She did that, and I documented that. Uh, I videotaped all of these early sessions, so it's available on my YouTube page. Wow. Um, and the um, <clears throat> outcome of this first meeting with Cass was I thought we were going to write a book on past lives because... I was sort of doubtful up until that moment when I saw her uh, writhing in her chair, uh, expressing terror and pain and so on. Uh, but that moment, I decided, wow, this is actual, this is real. I think maybe we're going to write a book together. Uh, so I agreed with her to explore it further uh, in the next few days. We would do another regression, see where else that would take us. Um, but in the interim, she phoned me up and said that uh, some guy, named, some spirit named Seth, was interrupting her meditation. She used to do a meditation with uh, the Maitreya, Benjamin Krem's group. They call it a transmission meditation. Uh, members of this group from all over the world meditate at the same time on the Maitreya this sort of ascended master spirit and she was having trouble uh, in those meditations because this guy Seth was coming to saying he wants to write books again so Cass did not have any idea who Seth was but when she mentioned the name I said Seth well I have some experience I read all of his books and that was true. I, was, I considered myself a, a student of Seth, though I hadn't read those books in yeah. decades. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what happened was uh, we brought Cass into my office in a, a few days from that first session. I um, had some of Seth's old books that he wrote with Jane Roberts around to make him feel comfortable, I guess. I don't know why I did that. Um, and as it turns out, uh, after just a few, about two or three minutes of doing suggestions, uh, I heard this uh, gruff voice come from Cass. Said, Mark, I'm here. You asked for me, I'm here. I said, are you Seth? Uh, he said, indeed I am. I said, are you Jane Roberts, Seth, the one that spoke for Jane and wrote all those great books? He said, of course. Uh, you asked for me, I'm here, I'm eager to write books again. Words to that effect. So I was kind of blown away, obviously, 
and immediately I thought, well, I was very close to graduation in my I was in my senior year at Dominican and thought, oh, my uh, perhaps my professors and colleagues, other students are pranking me. A very elaborate prank, I thought, is what I was experiencing <laughs> because it was so unreal. Uh, it was um, it was kind of spooky at first. <laughs> yeah. But over, over the course of that hour, uh, Seth uh, sort of soothed my fears and made preparations to begin publishing books again. So in that that hour that we talked to him, I asked him a few validating questions to make sure that it was the Jane Roberts Seth, and he answered them to my satisfaction. Uh, and then we, uh, because we thought this might be a one-shot deal, that uh, he would come through and then not come back, we asked him some personal questions about our lives. Uh, and another question about the, uh, uh, at that time, and it may be still so, in Marin County, California, there was this high incidence of breast cancer in women uh, around that, count, that county, mm -hmm. uh, much so than around uh, neighboring counties, uh, other states, and we wondered why. And he gave us a very detailed reason um, for that. I, I'm, I'll ask your listeners to go to the website or go to the YouTube uh, to discover that, but he gave us a good reason, and I followed up on that with scientists. Uh, um, it's, as it turns out, uh, from his perspective, it was related to uh, oak disease, a mutated pathogen uh, that also causes oak disease. Uh, if you're familiar with sudden oak death, uh, a big problem here in this part of California. Right. Um, uh, what occurred next? Well, we started writing the books. In the, the very next meeting, Seth started dictating 9-11, The Unknown Reality of the World, his first book of new material uh, since Jane passed away, almost 20 years. In 20 years, and in six weeks, we had all the material uh, for the book. Uh, he he does this thing where he puts it uh, in our consciousness. It's like a download, uh, to use the computer metaphor, and it comes out intact. Uh, when uh, Cass was channeling stuff, uh, she describes it in a similar way. Uh, it just comes to you. And uh, as I channel Seth, it comes to me in a form of automatic writing. It's as though I download the information from him and then take the time and uh, the physical world to translate this etheric material into words and then input to my word process. So that's the way I do it. Uh, but the book... Uh, uh, came to us intact in that we didn't have to, we had to punch away, but all of the material that you read in the first book was uh, literally from those early uh, dictations. And it's been that way ever since. Cass had to leave the program with this project um, early on after the publishing of the first book. Uh, she was worried about, well, she didn't know who Seth was in the beginning, but when she learned about Jane Roberts and uh, some of the difficulties her and her husband had with uh, people looking for Seth wisdom, camping out on the front porch, that type of thing, yeah. <laughs> uh, she realized she would no longer have privacy uh, if she uh, continued this project. So Seth taught me how to uh, picked up his communication stream, and uh, I've been his collaborator over the last 10 books, or the last, um, yikes, 12 years. Uh, 
uh, that brings us here today with me talking to you on the telephone. <laughs> so, now, Seth, who who was Seth in his life? I, I'm taking it that he was alive at one time, like we are. Yes. <coughs> oh, yes. Well, he describes himself as a non-physical being. Uh, he also says he's an energy personality. Uh, and what he does, it's, it's kind of difficult to describe, but he's energy. Uh, uh, he is uh, a representation of uh, the reincarnational theory of reality. If you're familiar with that, reincarnation, mm -hmm. he calls it uh, simultaneous lives. He maintains that all humans have, uh, yes, the life they're living currently. Here, uh, in this moment, we're all living these separate lives. Uh, I'm a separate person talking to you, another separate person. Uh, but then, in fact, also, uh, beyond what, what he calls linear time, is the spacious moment in which we are experiencing many, many lives. Lives from the distant past, let's say, and lives from the distant future also. And these <clears throat> many lives of his, uh, he used them to assemble personality aspects that are likable. Uh, he chooses aspects of his many lives in which he was uh, a kindly grandfather, for example, because people are comfortable around that type of energy. And his presentation is one of uh, uh, what I get is he reminds me of this elderly school teacher I had once in junior high. So it was just so sweet and knowledgeable and wise um, and powerful. Hmm. So that's his presentation. and. It worked for him with Jane and her husband. Uh, it comes across in his uh, dictation, in his messages. Uh, but the sh short answer is he's uh, uh, deceased. He no longer has uh, need for a human body, and that's why he has contacted uh, people like me, folks who are in his soul family, he calls it now, uh, he used to call it the uh, Seth entity. I'm a Seth entity human counterpart. He needs us to take his messages and create books in physical reality because he doesn't have the wherewithal to do that. He doesn't have a body. <laughs> <laughs> so when he's giving you the dictation, um, so do you just... Do you write with him in the fact that you're actually putting your you have input into the content, or is it just all all from him? That's uh, that's a sort of a touchy subject. Oh, okay. Uh, I think there's well, I'm going to answer it. Uh, I think there's always my input, uh, just as I. It's my belief that when he spoke to Jane. Uh, there is always her input also. You can't help it. You're basically translating uh, the ineffable, something that can't be put into words, into words. He calls it the ancient wisdom communication stream. And so I try to keep out of it as much as possible. But after the fact, I read the books and I, I can see, oh, well, here's where my knowledge of psychology comes in so that I could express the inevitable, uh, an idea that Seth was, was trying to make <clears throat> manifest in his books. Um, and, and I could do that because of my uh, schooling in psychology. And uh, uh, that speaks to a difference between Jane's books and my books. Uh, Jane was... Uh, a female. She was a poet. Uh, she was sort of a poet uh, priestess. Uh, I see her in that way. Uh, and so her books with Seth have this lyrical, poetic sensibility, I think. 
she was also a very good writer, and so they're profoundly interesting, I think. Now, my books, uh, because Seth is uh, speaking uh, through me to create a simplification of his teaching, uh, to appeal to a broader audience, uh, my books have a different uh, sensibility about them. They are more simplified. They uh, don't have a poetic aspect, but they do have a psychological underpinnings, you might say, because mm -hmm. of my background in psychology. Uh, so in terms of is, do I put my stuff in the mix? Yeah, it can't be helped. But uh, Jane tried to keep herself out of it as much as possible, and so do I. Uh, I don't think I have... Um, <laughs> I don't think it's my place to put my... Uh, values or my thoughts and ideas into the Seth books. And I think I've been pretty good at preventing that from happening. Right. Is there something different um, with what Seth was doing with Jane Roberts than what he's doing with you? Like, is it kind of a different subject or direction? I think so, yeah. Well, in his first three books he wrote with us, um, uh, he calls it the books on the awakening of humanity. And he maintained and still suggests that humanity is uh, awakening. We're all coming up in frequency. Uh, we're learning about <clears throat> our other lives and so on. Uh, each of us ha are at a particular stage of what he calls soul evolution. And according to that stage we're at, we're uh, identifying our issues, he says, and learning our lessons. Uh, so in his books with us, uh, they're, all the material is centered around that uh, dynamic, uh, that we are in really interesting times, uh, that we are opening up um, now with Jane's books, um, I don't think there was as much mm, alarm uh, as there are as the books we did with Seth. Uh, back then, it was a matter of Seth uh, attempting to convince people that he was real. <laughs> and uh, he sort of courted the reader. Uh, in a sense, he he put on this aspect, oh, I'm the, I'm the gentle, friendly grandfather, and here is the truth of your reality, that you create your reality, uh, that you are experiencing uh, your thoughts, uh, your, the imagery within your consciousness, uh, the feelings, your, the emotions that you're having uh, made manifest in front of you. As feedback of your consciousness, uh, you see the world in front of you, your personal reality, he calls it. Uh, so that was sort of a scholarly role for him, uh, updating people on the truth of their realities. And a lot of people call him the uh, father of the New Age for that. And he was one of the first to talk about uh, the way reality actually works. And this predates quantum theory also by a few years. Uh, but the books he's written with us have a sense of alarm uh, because he says that in the interim, uh, the last 20 years after Jane Roberts passed away, in the interim he says that our uh, world has regressed uh, to a point where these uh, non-physical beings such as Seth and others uh, are worried about the state of the world, that uh, there's a danger that we will destroy it uh, with nuclear weapons uh, and other, uh, other weapons mm -hmm. uh, to the degree that all life will uh, be destroyed. Uh, and because he 
as an extra dimensional being uh, has a stake in it. He exists in the dimensions of Earth, uh, the fourth, fifth, and sixth dimension. He says if the Earth goes down the tubes, him and the other uh, non-physical beings also go down the tubes. So he has a vested interest in educating humanity at this time. Uh, did I answer the question? Yeah, I think so. I just so he has to, more of an alarm point of view now. Uh, he's more worried about um, the world and what people are doing. Um, is there a reason why the world regressed? Well, there's yes, there's a, a few reasons that I've uh, I've noted. But the primary one is poor leadership. Uh, he says that our world is being run by uh, negative leaders primarily. And these uh, men and women are driven by uh, not the positive gods, uh, but the negative gods. They get their energy from uh, lusting after power, uh, not doing the people's will, now, this is a broad generalization I'm talking right, about. Right, right, yeah. Uh, I think your listeners know what I'm getting at. Oh, I'm, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> yes, so these uh, negative leaders uh, don't have our best interests at heart and are uh, extracting the resources of the earth for, their, for themselves, their friends, uh, uh, politicians, business leaders, uh, corporate leaders and so on, uh, they're taking uh, the essence of our planet uh, for their own benefit and uh, could care less about us, the common citizen, uh, as Seth calls us. Um, so with that in mind, it makes sense that uh, we're seeing the negative realities of uh, these diseases that can't be conquered. Uh, with uh, <clears throat> environmental disasters being commonplace. Uh, in that sense, Seth says that this is a literal case of the Earth herself, if you follow that metaphor, of the Gaia metaphor, let's call it, mm -hmm. uh, is waking up and is um, prone to do damage when she does that through earthquakes, uh, volcanic activity, um, uh, earth events that threaten to put an end to humanity. Uh, just uh, the metaphor that hum human beings uh, can be considered as a sort of parasite on this uh, wonderful planet of ours, and that she might be better off if she got rid of that parasite. <coughs> Yeah, it's causing too much trouble. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, yes, that's what Seth is about, essentially. Uh, instead of negative leaders, he suggests that there's this aspect of our collective consciousness that's coming up to heal the collective uh, as an antidote to the negative leaders. He calls it the visionary leader identity or role, the, um, that all of us have within our mental environment. Uh, it's a role that we can embody in which we don't simply look out for our own interests, but for everyone's interests. So your every thought, emotion, every conceived image is directed at, well, what's good for me, obviously, but what's good for what's the good, highest good for everyone, everyone on the planet. Uh, and he suggests that uh, over the next few years, there's a, a dynamic of uh, evolutionary consciousness in which these negative leaders are going to be swept away uh, for the good of the planet and for the good of humanity. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of seeing that. <laughs> I hope that's true. <laughs> Well, can hope, you know, that something gets better from it. You also do um, readings with people, don't you? 
Uh, yes, that's how we that's how we support ourselves here at Seth Returns Publishing. The books are uh, well. Seth said we just use the books as uh, business cards, uh, price them cheaply, send out a lot of e-books at a very low price, so that people can uh, make that connection. Uh, Seth's idea that the people that read his books and that understand them and grow uh, out of that connection are his people. Uh, the Seth entity uh, getting together again in this lifetime uh, to talk about what really matters, to talk about the truth uh, that we do create our realities, that uh, no one is going to rescue us, we have to rescue ourselves. Uh, so the assumption is that after they uh, discover that Seth is talking uh, to humans again and writing books. They order the books, they read the books, and they decide, oh, well, this is what I've been looking for. This is the truth. They identify it, and then they often phone up for uh, phone sessions. Uh, and in these sessions, Seth acts like a sort of uh, ghost coach. <laughs> spirit coach, what have you, uh, helping people with their everyday issues uh, with regards to relationships, finances. Uh, he speaks uh, from this um, perspective of uh, the reincarnational uh, trajectory uh, so that, for example, uh, He's talking to someone who's having relationship problems. Uh, he encourages often uh, these people to look at the big picture and to see where uh, this person may be in your life, in other lives also. They're coming into this existence now because of, let's say, unresolved issues from other lives. And people often can do that. Seth calls it multitasking where they see the person in front of them, their partner, uh, for who they are now, obviously, they're in a human body, they're male or female, or what have you, uh, but also see who and what they are in other lives. Often they are of another, of the opposite sex. So you're having a problem with your husband in this life, um, you're fighting, let's say, if you can get this greater picture, this reincarnational perspective, you might realize that in a past life that you had with this fellow, that he was a female and you were the male. So you're reversing your roles in this existence, uh, but you're still working on issues from that last life. Power issues, usually. Right. Who has the power? Um, stuff like that. Uh, all kinds of issues. Uh, he helps people with uh, over the telephone. Yeah. So we carry over our issues from life to life. Yeah. Uh, the way I put it, all our lives are happening now. It, it just looks like they're past because we're in this linear time construct with one moment seem to occur, seems to occur after another. Uh, that's not the way uh, reality actually works, however. Everything happens at once. All of our lives are happening, unfolding uh, at once. Uh, if you can, Seth tells us that if we can get a grasp of that, we can easily peek into those other lives in times of meditation or when you're walking in nature and uh, receive the benefits of those communications. Uh, often we can, uh, let's say, ask for counsel People talk, uh, in New Age circles, people talk about uh, connecting with their source, uh, their guides, the angels, and so on. Uh, Seth talks about uh, the possibilities of connecting to your other lives, your simultaneous lives, and receiving guidance, uh, particularly, and this is sort of a weird concept, uh, to describe particularly uh, future lives uh, because all of our lives are occurring all at once 
we can access future lives uh, right where we are now, right in this moment. And if that is the case, it seems to me that it would be productive to tune in on uh, a future life, perhaps this life of mine that I'm uh, participating in now, progress 10 or 20 years uh, to see where I'm at, to see what happened. Are there uh, um, health ramifications? Uh, should I choose to go on to keep on this particular diet I'm on and so on? Um, it's a way to, it's not future tripping like some people have called it. <laughs> it's a peeking in on you, that would be me, in the future uh, and seeing the results of uh, our behaviors over time, over the next 10 or 20 years, let's say. Um, did I answer that question? I think so. Yeah. Seth, will he choose others to channel? Yeah, let me. Yeah, he is in communication with. He calls them a, a multitude of other souls. Uh, he says he's always been in communication uh, with people. Uh, he appears in their mental environment, and some people know him as, uh, well, that's my intuitive voice, or that's my guide, or these, this messages uh, from my angel beings. Uh, and some people identify him as Seth because they read uh, his earlier books, made that connection, and he acts as a uh, non-physical guide uh, to these people, many, many people. Uh, now, so he makes himself known and has uh, over the millennia, he says. So it's not a it's not uh, We at Wondery, creators of Dr. Death, Scamfluencers, and Over My Dead Body, go deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. And now we're launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Wondery's Exhibit C gives you the detective's lens of all of the evidence taking you step-by-step step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find us on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com and listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. Exhibit C, it's truly criminal. A manifestation with uh, Jane and her husband and me and Seth only. Uh, it's, it's something that's been done since uh, time began, you might say. Um, so the idea of others channeling him, I think there are a few. But according to Seth, I'm the only one that's writing books and spreading the message about his return and so on. Um, was was there a particular... A of, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, was there a particular reason he chose you to write the books? Uh, yes, there was. Uh, I... I know that from uh, everything that's transpired since we met. Uh, but yes, I had a, a definite skill set in place. Uh, I was, uh, well, first of all, I was a semi-expert in the Seth material because I read all, uh, most of the books, mainly back in the 80s, that's saying. So I was familiar with his teaching, and I was very interested in desktop publishing uh, back in the old days. Twenty years ago, I thought, wow, with desktop publishing, I don't have to get uh, uh, an agent and have people um, at the publishing companies turning me down. I can publish my own books. And I thought, well, at some point here, uh, 
probably in my 50s, I'm going to publish a book of some kind uh, as a project. So that was in place. Uh, and I was also, I was in this um, in graduate school uh, learning about uh, psychology, uh, but also with an emphasis on alternative practices such as hypnotherapy. And I learned how to hypnotize other people and to hypnotize myself to achieve the trance state. Uh, the trance state is what Seth used with Jane to make that connection and to uh, make it possible for them to write all those books, an altered state of consciousness. So all of those skills, uh, I, I have a skill of being able to dissociate uh, that's necessary when you're contacting these uh, non-physical beings. I can create a trance state rapidly. Uh, so, for those reasons, I think, uh, and uh, the main reason was, that according to Seth, uh, Cass and I, my client from the hypnotherapy office, mm -hmm. uh, agreed in a past life that once we turn 50 and all of all of that, uh, all of the drama that comes with uh, reaching 50, <laughs> all that comes uh, before that, raising families, settling down. For me, uh, uh, I quit drinking, and uh, I'd had sobriety for like 10 years when I met that. Uh, all of that stuff that could disrupt and uh, destroy a collaboration uh, with a dead guy basically said, <laughs> uh, we waited until we were 50 to begin the project. And we signed sort of a contract, Seth calls them soul contracts, agreed to meet uh, coincidentally and begin this project with Seth. It was um, coincidental that when Cass was looking for a hypnotherapist in the yellow pages, she came up across my little ad. I called it Deep Humor Hypnotherapy. And she thought to herself, wow, there's something about that. I have to look into that. I like the idea. So out of all the hypnotherapists, probably a hundred in Marin County, she chose me. Uh, and I later found out that Seth uh, sort of directed her attention to my name and uh, sort of inspired her to keep the appointment uh, and in that sense, uh, he brought her to me. Uh, and in that same way, he knew that uh, she was going to act as uh, an intermediary here and not stick around long because she had other spiritual pursuits to pursue. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. I'm not sure I would have kept with the program if I'd known that she was going to uh, take off and, uh, and put the, all the responsibilities for the books on my shoulders. Hmm. Uh, but it's, some people ask, well, how, how do you feel about being deceived by Seth? <laughs> because he didn't, he didn't warn me that there was the bumpy road ahead. Uh, and um, I have to be forgiving with him because... The end result is we're here 12, 13 years later. We have all these great books. We have uh, a network of loving souls all around the world who call us up. Uh, it was all worth it in retrospect, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and looking back, um, in, you know, looking back on your life and, and thinking back years ago, did, did you see this? as happening? Do you think you knew it was happening without knowing it? Do you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, there's a few. Uh, let me put it this way. I was uh, I was a weird kid in the, fact, in the sense that I was always interested in the realities of uh, the paranormal. I was always looking for true ghost stories true paranormal events and when I was growing 
growing up in Ogden, Utah, I used to spend all my time in the Carnegie Library there in this one section where they had all those books. Uh, particularly, I remember books by Frank Edwards, the science books. He called them Stranger Than Science, Beyond Science, uh, More Stranger Than Science, which were basically a collection of urban legends, uh, stories of UFOs, and so on. Uh, so I studied those books religiously. And uh, around that same time, back, let me check, it was probably eight or nine, I was messing around in this abandoned trailer just off of Hill Air Force Base. And having fun, and I came across a pile of UFO magazines uh, out of the, it was out of the 50s and became inspired to explore uh, UFOs uh, and that whole phenomena of, uh, well, where did they come from? I thought it was interesting that I discovered these magazines just off of an Air Force base. <laughs> uh, and so that connection uh, is an important one to think about. <laughs> um, but that's that's how I grew up. I was all, I've always been interested in uh, the unusual. Uh, I've been obsessed with it, basically. Did Did and you have so any experiences? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, extra. Yeah, I've had weird experiences all my life. Um, one that is one that stands out uh, when I was living in Ogden, Utah. We. Uh, were renters in this big old spooky house and it had a uh, room that the people who owned the property said do not go in that room <laughs> um, so what's, what do we do me and my sister a year younger the first thing we do I mean we've been living in the house a week is we pop that lock uh, precocious kids and explored what was going on in the inside. And um, this little closet had an environment that it was like, um, I don't know, fear is what it was. Uh, you could you could feel good about yourself on the outside, open the door, get in that little room, and feel really bad, feel uh, despondent, feel pain, and so on. Uh, so we mm, uh, agreed not to get back in that room, uh, but the upshot of all this was that uh, after living there for a year, uh, my father got us all together and we uh, left Utah and came to California to live. And it was years later that um, he said that, well, it was because of the ghosts that lived there. And in retrospect, I can remember, I had an old roll-top desk in my bedroom there. Uh, it used to regularly, with no one in the room, roll itself up. Uh, I can see uh, a roll-top desk accidentally rolling itself down, but not up. Uh, and so that used to be spooky. Uh, and then, um, on further investigation, uh, asking my mother and father what was going on. Uh, that small room was uh, where they kept uh, their daughters, the people who owned the house, their daughters' uh, belongings. Their daughter committed suicide there a couple of weeks before we moved in. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, <clears throat> and then, of course, after the fact, you look back and say, oh, well, that explains a lot. So, it explains that trepidation on entering the little room and a lot of other mysterious, uh, like poltergeist activity going on. Uh, but that was one memorable event, paranormal activity. Did you have any with, as far as the UFOs? Uh, well, yes, uh, the UFO activity. Living in uh, a couple of miles from the Air Force Base. Hill Air Force Base, 
and I used to have these um, night terrors uh, where I was, I felt like someone was holding me down, uh, paralyzed, uh, and I'd open my eyes and there would be um, sort of nebulous creatures around. Uh, they were sort of assuming shapes of uh, uh, sometimes polar bears, uh, sometimes humanoid shapes, but I'd be paralyzed. I'd be unable to uh, shout out. And then after a while, um, uh, the images would fade, and I'd go uh, back into deep sleep, I guess. Uh, the It took me a long time, years, to figure out what that might have been, uh, some sort of contact experience. And I think it was... Uh, connected to my discovery of those UFO magazines and the uh, sort of altered state uh, I, I brought in when I read those books. Uh, the early UFO magazines didn't talk much about uh, the extraterrestrial connection. Uh, that was sort of left unspoken, uh, but that whole thing set me on a trajectory of researching the uh, ufologists of the time, Adamski and so on. Uh, very fruitful explorations I've had since then. And to this day, I, when I'm under stress, it seems, uh, I have those same sort of paralyzing dreams in which uh, I, I feel like I'm being uh, explored. Somebody's researching me, in other words. Right. Huh. And so, how did this affect you as growing up and in your life? Like, um, I guess I would say that um, Ogden's pretty um, Mormon-based. So, how does that react with uh, with Mormons in the area or other religions? Well, I was. I would say that um, I resisted that, even though I was, uh, my grandmother wanted me baptized as a Mormon, and so I was baptized. Uh, I never went to church, and I kind of, uh, I was leery of that. The, so, the whole organized religion thing was uh, too strange for me to pursue uh, at that time, so I think I escaped it. I largely escaped it. Uh, and went to, uh, I, I enjoyed reading about uh, hypnotism, and I enjoyed reading about Rasputin and Houdini and so on back in those days, uh, alternative practices. Uh, I think I largely uh, escaped any sort of permanent imprinting from those days. That's why I say I was kind of a strange kid back then, um, always looking for the unusual. Yeah. Did it cause any problems, like uh, going to school or or even as, even as an adult now? Um, do you have any bad reactions to uh, writing the books and, and Seth or any of that? Well, yes. Um, I would say that the uh, writing the second and third books with Seth, I, I, I encountered, um, uh, well, I had a bad case of blindness. I went completely blind for about three months, and everyone was telling me to stop with the project, that it was uh, somehow as being invaded, and my sight was being taken from me by Seth or negative entities, and so on and so on. Uh, I pursued uh, the projects further, uh, and in the third book we wrote with Seth, he talks about self-healing. It's a thing called the healing regimen. Uh, I use that information and his practices to uh, pull myself out of that. Uh, to heal myself and pre 
vent the downward slide <laughs> uh, uh, into death. Uh, so I stopped that. Uh, but as far as a bad reaction, yes, uh, going blind yeah. was one. And 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 so you got over that. Obviously, is w did you ever have any medical? Uh, did you see a doctor about it? And did they ever say what happened or? Uh, well, I don't talk about that much. I, oh, okay. I keep that between me and Seth. Okay. Yeah, no, not a problem. Just a natural question there for me. I just... Um, so, in a phone session, um, what actually happens, or, or how long does it take? Well, we have... Uh, we have a 20-minute session. Uh, 30 and 60 minute sessions. For the most part, our people are long term. We've been having Seth talk to his students for about 10 years uh, on the phone. And typically, what happens is someone will have read the book, uh, the book on healing, let's say, the first book, or some of the later books, and they'll be. Uh, triggered sort of uh, by an example Seth talks about in the books. He gives a lot of examples to pull the reader in and then he sort of delivers this he calls it a subtext of uh, wisdom, ancient wisdom he calls it. Uh, the main one being, well you create your reality. Take responsibility for your creations. Create a positive reality for yourself and humanity and so on. Uh, so that that's what usually happens. People are inspired to phone us up and have a session. Uh, and because it does require a certain knowledge of who Seth is, uh, his practice, his theories, uh, you have to have a little bit of that background, whether it's from reading Jane's books or our books. And it begins simply with uh, people asking questions. I, uh, it takes about 30 seconds for me to bring Seth in, and people begin asking questions. Seth answers their questions uh, in a context of, well, uh, an individual human with particular issues, learning particular lessons. Uh, and he helps you to identify those issues and see where you may be avoiding lessons, where you may be intellectualizing. Uh, so they get to the root causes of uh, issues. If someone has a health issue, for example, uh, Seth often says that, well, you, you created it. You're creating it for learning experiences, uh, for example. Uh, and then the person might say, oh, well, that's unbelievable. Why would I create a cancer to learn? What am I learning by dying of cancer? And so Seth works with people to see, to identify and be responsible for their input into the creation of the malady. And then he helps them reverse that by changing how they uh, see it when you can think of an illness, a chronic illness, as a lesson, uh, you begin to see where you are creating or helping to create the illness. So he teaches people how to uh, turn around uh, to their opposites these negative suggestions we give ourselves that keep us sick, that keep us in fear, keep us depressed. Uh, and it's a matter of uh, thought, image, emotion replacement after that, and make a, making a habit out of uh, creating positive realities, uh, positive realities of health, uh, abundance, uh, loving relationships, and so on. Uh, in that way, he, he is sort of this spirit coach for people. Has there, has there been any time that you've um, been in a phone reading or a reading 
and something's really surprised you that you've learned? Surprising, yes. I'm surprised most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> because his theory is that, uh, well, you and I, let's use that example. Seth would say that uh, you and I, in another existence, in a past life, let's say, made an appointment to uh, meet up and talk about this and to put it on the air uh, for reasons of helping people. Uh, he would probably say that we're do-getter types, that we're, you and I are uh, members of a family of consciousness he calls Sumari, very creative, super sensitive people. Uh, but we're people who um, we like to create systems and we do but we don't like to keep them running we'd rather other people uh, take over that function <laughs> so uh, he says that we're a very childlike family of consciousness uh, and that we mm, most of us are here in this time frame to participate in the awakening of others. Uh, so I'm always surprised by how that always comes up with Seth's clients. Uh, 99 to 9 tenths percent of the time, uh, those are their issues. Uh, that they are, uh, for example, a lot of his uh, students or clients uh, are what he calls the... Uh, visionaries, uh, magicians, shamans, witches, and healers of all types, he calls them. And they are people who are healers, who are uh, teachers, visionaries, entrepreneurs, uh, and they are <coughs> experiencing um, awakenings of various types. Uh, that's why they come to Seth. Uh, but, yeah, almost every phone session we have with someone, uh, I can see myself. I see their issues as a reflection of mine. Uh, and uh, for that reason, I think it's uh, important work we're doing, at least for this group, uh, the self-entity human counterparts. Mm -hmm. and, and now, I've, I've noticed, too, you, you have a series of reality change CDs that you offer on your website. Um, so tell us a little bit about what these are, what their purpose is. The reality chain CDs, yeah, oh yeah, that's right. The, um, these are becoming our most popular product. Uh, I, I, I'm sort of caught off guard here because of, uh, I put all my uh, work into the books. And now people are finding that the CDs are handier. Um, they are on specific issues that people have. So we have one on awakening. I just said that most of our students, most of our clients, identify themselves as an awakening person. They're looking for the truth of their reality. They're not... Uh, they're moving away from being a consumer, uh, someone that uh, is vitally interested in authority figures, to an independent, uh, one who is starting to value their own guidance. Uh, so this Awakening CD uh, helps people to uh, own that. Uh, you identify whether it's true or not, and then you own it. Uh, and each CD has, on one side, there's a, a little ritual in which Seth helps you to access, access your guidance. He affirms that all of us have guides, whether we know it or not consciously. Uh, they are these beings that present themselves as imaginary playmates when we're young, uh, but through socialization and uh, through our parents and caregivers denouncing them and saying, get rid of those guys, uh, they retreat to the background of consciousness, you might say. 
but now as adults, uh, we can rekindle those relationships, uh, the non-physical beings, the guides, uh, some of them representing the an your ancestors, some representing your other lives, uh, some of them representing uh, elemental spirits, uh, the angelic kingdom, and so on. Uh, it goes on and on. But that's, he calls that the calling in the guides ritual. So you assemble your guides, you create a state of sanctuary, he calls it, before exploring the psyche or the unknown reality, as he calls it, the underworld, the paranormal world. He suggests that people create uh, intentionally a state of sanctuary so that you're less inclined to be bothered by uh, the negative beings, the negative non-physical beings, what he calls negative entities. So you call in your guides, you create a state of sanctuary, and then you explore uh, this awakening of yours. Or if you're having health issues, he helps you to narrow in on the uh, emotional foundations of your illness uh, to see where you may be the identified sick person in your family, for example, which is very common for people. Uh, they uh, react to telepathic messages from people in their family to be sick, to get sick, to remain sick over time. Uh, there's a lot of people out there like that. Uh, in this tape, or in this uh, CD, I'm sorry, Seth teaches you how to adopt a more healthy role for yourself to not identify yourself as the sick person in your family, and perhaps identify yourself as the opposite, as a visionary of your family, the one that's going to uh, break the cycle uh, of uh, having to have a sickly person in the family uh, to blame, let's say. Uh, and we have other CDs on other topics, which are largely uh, altered states of consciousness that are beneficial to people who have particular issues. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. And um, I was just going to ask about the, now you like to do hypnosis. Um, hmm. Do you find it hard to hypnotize people or for people to be hypnotized? Do, no, I don't. I think it's the most natural, common state of consciousness uh, for humans. I think we're always in a trance of some sort, uh, even when we don't think we are. Uh, even when we're, uh, let's say you're an office worker and you're typing, uh, you're typing something uh, from a book or something, putting it into a word processor. You're in a trance state. Uh, Seth would say you're multitasking often that often when we're, uh, uh, even when we're with friends, let's say, chatting about something, having a cup of coffee, and seem to be there <laughs> physically uh, talking about football or what have you, that uh, uh, as multitasking adults, we are elsewhere. We take our consciousness, split off a piece of it, and uh, with eyes wide awake, we visit other locales, uh, other lifetimes, for example, picking up information from other lifetimes, uh, talking to our guides, talking to uh, deceased members of our soul families. Uh, it happens all the time, and he calls it multitasking, and it is a form of trance that people are in quite naturally. Uh, one trance state that we do not like around here is one that he calls the common trance. Uh, that is the state of consciousness in which the average citizen uh, is moving forward, uh, earning a living, let's say, perhaps it's something they don't really like, so that they can uh, make enough money to consume um, in the common trance, he says, 
he says that the entire collective of humanity in the modern world uh, is in this trance state in which you're receiving direction uh, from uh, the elite rulers of the world uh, in which you believe the messages in the media, the negative media he calls it, to consume in which you believe the what he calls the propaganda that comes through in newscasts of all types. Um, so the common trance keeps you uh, in this mode of creating the status quo reality. Uh, but it is a trance state. Uh, he suggests that people wake themselves up from the common trance and try uh, intentional uh, co-creation. That's where one uh, pursues or looks for guidance from within, uh, not from without, not not from political leaders, because we're never going to get it from political leaders. No. <laughs> uh, we we'll get manipulation from them, but not guidance. So he suggests you look within uh, and surprise yourself by finding the guidance you seek, uh, the uncommon trance, he calls it. And you will be guided out of that status quo reality and on a path of awakening to your uh, to the truth of your personal reality, whatever that might be. As I just said, uh, you might find that you don't have to be sick. That's, it's just a role that you've taken that was foisted on you at birth, let's say, because you were an underweight uh, baby. Um, that type of thing, yes. It's not hypnotized. It's not difficult to hypnotize people, and um, every politician will tell you that. Yeah, <laughs> they are they are busy hypnotizing and telling us that everything is okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> constantly, constantly. For sure. Well, okay. So now, how how would be the best way for people to get a hold of you, uh, reach you for a reading, or your books or CDs? Well, thanks for asking. Uh, we have a website, SethReturns.com. It uh, contains contact information. Uh, it's a place where you can order all of our books. Uh, currently, uh, Amazon is having a hard time keeping our books uh, coming in so that people can buy them. So we suggest that uh, if you want if you want to select from our entire catalog of books, uh, come to the website, sethreturns.com. Uh, if you want a reading, there's, click on the uh, reading link at the top of the page. Uh, if you want to know, if you suspect that you may be one of Seth's peeps, one of his uh, human counterparts, he calls them, uh, sign up for the newsletter. And you will receive, or well, let's call it monthly uh, transmissions in which Seth talks a bit about uh, what's in store for us in the next 30 days or so, uh, and news about our events and so on. So that's the best way to keep in touch. Okay, great. Now, are you planning on going to any speaking engagements or any sort of places uh to, so pe people can meet you in person, any of the Paracons? Or... Well, we're associated with this collective called the New Year's Expo. Uh, we really like it because uh, that's what Seth is about also. He, he says that you're in the New Year's now. If you can remove those barriers, uh, your personal barriers, that you can see the New Year's. Uh, so I was keyed into that, and I signed up for a bunch of events. They're mainly in California, Southern California, Northern California. Uh, the next big one is with a group called the New Living Expo. Uh, they used to call themselves a Whole Life Expo some time ago, the premier New Age Festival uh, collective. That's going to occur uh, April 24th, 25th, and 26th 
in San Mateo, and we're going to be there with, I'm going to have Seth provide uh, some readings for people, and we're going to do a lecture on our project together. Uh, Seth is going to hold court there. It's, it promises to be a, a fun event. Uh, we'll, we'll be filming part of a documentary we're doing about Seth there also. So wow. if any of your listeners want to come on down, yeah. we'll be there. I'm sure. That uh, sounds pretty exciting. And actually what we'll do is we'll um, put all your links onto our web page and, and yeah. information so people can get a hold of you or your book. And books and uh, thank you very much for taking the time to do the interview thank you Warren it's been a real pleasure to find out more about our show guests or to listen to past shows from our archive please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com show is over for now was it as good for you as it was for me well good night this has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, yeah. good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.